Greetings, friends. Well, so this is the last tie-in with Ephesians for this month. And it's interesting that Ephesians was written in a time of pre-Christianity. Because in the first century there, Christians weren't really called Christians just yet. The, the, the following Jesus was called the way. It was later in the first century that the people in Ephesus would start being called Christians. That's where Christian came out. That's where it started in Ephesus. But at the time that Paul's writing to them, they're a church that's immersed in a society that's filled with a whole bunch of little G-gods, 50 of them, the archaeologists have determined, the largest one being Artemis, the god of fertility. And everybody, the Gentiles that had come in, brought with them preconceived ideas. And the Jews, the, the Jewish people that came in, they brought with them the Jewish ideas of how they were supposed to be the Messiah. For example, some were coming in saying that, you know, if you're going to follow the Jewish Messiah, then you have to be circumcised. You have to follow all the rituals of a Jew first before you can claim the Jewish Messiah. And Paul had said, ah, in the first part, of, first part of Ephesians, the first three chapters, he lays out that whether you're a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, the thing that ties you all together is Christ. It has nothing to do with where you came from. It's where you are now. And so he stressed their identity, their heavenly citizenship of being Christian. Then in chapters 4 and 5, he emphasizes what that means about leaving your old life behind, taking on the new mind of Christ, living a new life in Christ, and the things that you're supposed to do as part of that. In chapter 6 begins what's called a proporation, proration, proration, a peroration. I stumbled over that word in practice too. It's peroration. And what that is is it's the end of a, like a speech or a sermon where it's an encouragement, it's an exhortation. It means it's a tying together all the points that were before. And so in chapter 6, that's what Paul's trying to do. In the first nine verses of chapter 6, he does part of what we commonly refer to as family codes. He talks about husbands and wives and masters and slaves. But in Ephesians, it has a bit of a twist because it's telling those that are in the power structures, whether it be a husband or a slave master or a wealthy person or anybody like that, hold on, just because of your enhanced status, the, in the Greco-Roman world, if you were a person of means or a position of power, then that means God had blessed you in some way. And so a lot of people in those positions tended to lord it over those under them. In other places, Paul points that out. But in Ephesians, he says, if you're a husband or if you're a slave master, just know that you're not going to get any special consideration in heaven just because you had a position of power on earth. No, you're going to be judged in heaven by how fairly you treated those who were supposed to be under you. And in the case of husbands, did you treat your wife as an equal partner in your marriage? And slave owners, did you treat your slaves with the respect that they're due because they're making it possible for you to live a life of luxury or to, to, to live a life of profitability? Without them, you couldn't. So are you treating them with due respect for that? Or are you treating them poorly and beating them and threatening them and all that. So he gives them those warnings. So when we get to verse 10 in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he's now going to equip the Christians, the Ephesian Christians, Jews or Gentiles, the Ephesian Christians on what they need to go forth because the truth of the matter is they're in a pre-Christian pre society, pre-Christian time in means of the church, pre-church time. Kind of like us now, many modern theologians, especially the traditional theologians, believe we're in a post-Christian time here in North America. And what they mean by that is the world in Ephesians' time and the world in our time no longer considers, or didn't consider yet, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian normativity for the basis of the laws, the fairness, and all that. I mean, we know our country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. But there are those in our modern society that are trying to erase some of those Judeo-Christian values, and they're trying to institute new values. And some of those values aren't really all that new. In the 20th century, many of those values were tried, and they failed all over the world. Okay, so we know those don't work, but yet apparently 
There's folks still trying to do that in our country, post-Christian. They're trying to erase the Christian values. We've seen it. Well, in the Ephesian Christian time, most of the people in town had a pagan viewpoint. They didn't have a Judeo-Christian viewpoint. So the similarities to the challenges that the Ephesian Christians faced living in the world, in their world, are the same that we're starting to face now as traditional Christians in our world. The tides and the, the oceans that are coming against us are the same in terms of trying to diminish and minimize who we are, what we believe, and the values that we hold to. And so Paul's going to set the Ephesian Christians up, and it's a message for us too because it's for Christians of all time. See, Jesus didn't come to save us from our stuff and lift us up into being with him just for us to go out and live as the world lives. He didn't do that. But yet, most of us are afraid, we're afraid, to go out and confront the world or to live into our faith. Mostly because we get verbally, we get verbally assaulted. I mean, we can admit that. It happens on social media, right? You post something Christian, next thing you know, some of the people on your page or people that are commenting on your wall about, yeah, that Christian stuff or whatever, you get blasted for it. Even if you like something that somebody else puts up, you get blasted for that too. If you try to pay, pray in public, people make snide comments three tables over. It, it's very difficult to live our faith. Somehow we think that maybe we shouldn't live our faith. We should just keep it private. How many of you have heard of a uh, Vody Bauckham? Anybody here heard of Vody Bauckham? He's a famous preacher, theologian. He's a, a, a dean of a seminary. And he does a lot of sermons that are online, and he's a, he's a traditional Christian. And he's got a word for us before we read the Scripture today. He's got a word for us about what, what's going on in our world. And I couldn't say it better than him, so we're going to let him say it. Doug? Neutrality is not an option. And, and so many Christians are under the deluded impression that if we just keep our head down, if we just go to church, if we just practice our faith in our home, if we, if we, if we just do that, that, that they'll leave us alone. But they won't. They won't. I don't know if you've been watching lately, but it's not enough for you to just refuse to be hostile. It is now demanded that you bend the knee and confess Caesar is Lord. You can't be neutral. Try to be neutral if you want to. We're just gonna be neutral. We're just gonna go about our life. Yep, and then your daughter lines up in the track meet and there's a boy racing her. What do you do? Do you sit there, take the loss, clap when the trophy is given to the biological male? What do you do? What do you do when you go to work? And, and, and then they, they have this new policy at your work where you put your pronouns on everything and you say, no, no, I'm not gonna play the game. I'm just not gonna put the pronouns on there. And they say, no, 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 it's a policy. Put your pronouns on there, fine. I'll put my pronouns on there, but my pronouns are the pronouns that God gave me. Good for you, because that's just step one. You've put your pronouns, everybody else has put their pronouns, and then this is what happens. They come to you and they say, you must bear false witness. Look at that man and call him a woman. Neutrality is not an option. Friends, it's that real all around us. It's that real. So what do we do? What do we do? I mean, do, do we suddenly get brave and go out there and take the arrows? Take one for the team? What do we do? Paul has a 
solution for that because he knows exactly, exactly what the, Christian, the Christians in Ephesus are going through and what they're up against. Because see, just like we're invited to cookouts and stuff with friends, and we show up, and there's people there that are antagonistic to people of faith, so we be quiet, we stay quiet. We don't even pray over our meal there because we don't want to rile somebody up. But see, if you don't go to the events, then you get called out. Why didn't you come to the cookout? Well, because so-and-so there, there's people there that aren't friendly to Christians, and I want to be able to live my faith. Well, in the, the, in the first century, if you didn't go to the celebrations of Caesar, you see, Caesar was a deity. If you didn't go to the celebrations that acknowledged his deity status, then what they would do is, uh-huh, see, you won't honor Caesar because you're a Christian. You won't honor Caesar. So the persecutions started escalating. So what do you do? What do we do? Verse 10, chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. God's word for God's people. So I, I, I get it that it's easy for preachers, voting, me, other preachers, say, this is what you got to do. You got to confront this. You can't just stand still and be quiet. Well, even, even somebody that's not a particularly, mem particularly faithful person, Elon Musk, not long ago, he said, if Christians don't start standing up for right, Christianity in our country is going to die. People are starving out there, friends, for truth. Believe it or not, contrary to what you may be hearing out there on the street, the large number of people, the large percentage of people out there already know what truth is. And the fact that the world is reinforcing falsehood does not change the truth. It just means that people are being gaslighted on a mass scale. And sometimes we, people of faith, sometimes we, get gaslighted too. We just fall in line. Like Vody says, we try to stay neutral. I'm just going to stay neutral. I'm not going to get in that fight. Well, that's not really an option. Did anybody hear a word from God through the Holy Spirit telling you, just be neutral? Just go to church. Practice your faith in your house. Say a prayer in public in a restaurant only when it's safe. Or you're around a lot of people at your table so you feel safe. Did anybody hear a word from God to only play it safe? I haven't. In fact, some of us, we were living so much like the world that it's a miracle God even spoke to us at all. But he did. He pulled us out of the world. And he brought us here. He brought us to a place where we can fellowship with other believers. And so we got a comfortable place. We can practice our faith. We can do it at home. We can hang out with each other. Other Christians we know at other churches and stuff, we can hang out with them. Some have been longtime friends, and I dare say sometimes we're even friends with Calvinists, and that's okay. Vody's a Calvinist, but he spoke truth. But Paul tells us that God has a plan. 
and his plan is the armor of God. Now they use uh, 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 armor and that they use some different pieces and for all all these years, all these years that I've been reading this, like 35, 40 years, I've always thought the armor of God described was a Roman, was Roman stuff. Would you be surprised to know it wasn't? It wasn't Roman at all. It's from Old Testament references. Isaiah and Psalms. All of these come from Isaiah and Psalms. And the clue to that is there's a couple pieces that were integral to the Roman armor of the period, the things they wore on their shins and knees, and the spike that they used, the, the like javelin thing that they used, those were key parts of their, and they didn't really use a sword, they used a, a Roman knife that was shorter, but it was real heavy, so you could hit other swords and break them with it. It wasn't a long sword like they're talking about here, the Jewish sword was a longer one. This is all Jewish armor that the Jewish soldiers wore. And so he talks about a belt that goes around the waist the belt of truth. This truth is God's truth. It's the truth we get out of the Word of God. It's the truth we get from the Holy Spirit. God's truth. And you gird that around your middle because in those days, people wore those long coats, right? And they wore tunics and stuff. That's what everybody wore. They weren't wearing jeans and stuff. And the soldiers, though, wore a belt because they kept those clothes tight to the body. So when they were fighting, it was close and tight so they could maneuver better. That was actually a strategic part of what they wore, the belt of truth. It all began with the belt. Because, see, the belt held the sword. The belt also held the bottom of the breastplate. And the breastplate was the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate covers all right here, right? So what's the significant thing that's right here in the middle? It's your heart. So God's righteousness, we talked about righteousness last week. Righteousness is primarily, properly understood as the presence of God. Righteousness is the presence of God. Us walking with God, intentionally being aware of God, being, in our, being around us, and us choosing to acknowledge God in all we do. When we do that, God protects our hearts. But the interesting thing here is it's just a breastplate. John Wesley points out that there's no backplate. Another part of the Roman armor was a breastplate and a backplate. They came together. But in the Jewish armor, there was only a breastplate. Because you're never supposed to turn your back to your enemy. You're always supposed to face your enemy. So you need the breastplate on the front. Because your enemy's in front of you. Of course, they know the devil's circling, but the primary idea is when you know where evil is, when you know where your enemy is, you're confronting them face up. You're not running away. And right with that righteousness comes the helmet of salvation. And that helmet of salvation, the helmet's there to protect your head. Because that's the one part of your body that where one blow can take you out. One strike from the evil one into your mind can totally derail you. One errant thought, one false thought, one wrong thought can totally derail you from God. How many times have everybody sitting, has everybody sitting in this room encountered that in their own life? Way too many to even count. We hear something. Begin when we were teenagers. We might have grown up in the church. Been confirmed in the church. Done catechism or whatever you did. And by the time you're in high school, you're starting to hear these ideas. Imagine how bad it is today with the kids that are on the internet and TikTok and all that. You're talking about getting false ideas. You need the helmet. And the salvation that it talks about. Salvation comes, it, it, it's our hope, right? Salvation is our hope that God's going to take care of us. God's going to... Let us be with him through eternity. The very minimum of that hope is God's going to make, thing right, make things right with us when we get to him. That's the minimum. The full expression of that hope is we get assurance in the here and now that we are God's child. His spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and we can cry, Abba, Father, and we know here and now that we're saved. So I have the hope that salvation that 
tells you that you're going to get that golden ticket when you die. We have full assurance now that we Wesleyans believe you can have now. Remember when Wesley, John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. We can know now in this life that we're saved, that Jesus died for us, for our sins, for me, for you, individually. That's the fullest expression of our salvation now. And that protects our mind. God's word and righteousness and presence protects our hearts. Our hope, fully evolved with the assurance, protects our mind from those things that come in that will distract us and steer us wrong. We have the shoes. The shoes are the gospel of peace. This too comes from the Old Testament and Isaiah where God's people had their shoes on so they could traverse dangerous lands. They could go to dangerous places. They could go places where God was calling them to go and be safe going there because they traveled with God's peace. They went with God's peace. Very rarely do do people enter something with a peaceful attitude and they're assaulted, except in the modern world or in first century Ephesus when you have the 50 little G-gods versus the Christian monotheistic one God, creator God. If you didn't go to the parties, if you didn't go to the celebrations, okay, even though you would be peaceful about it, you'd still get called out because neutrality is not an option. And then you have the sword of truth. That sword of truth is God's Word. It's the Holy Spirit's presence with the truth. See, you can't derive any truth out of Scripture without the Holy Spirit giving it to you. Friends, every word in Scripture in the ancient Hebrew or the ancient Greek was written by the Holy Spirit using human hands and using humans to do it. That's what we believe. And if we believe that wholeheartedly, we believe it was written by the Holy Spirit for those humans to write it with the Holy Spirit's truth. Don't you think we need to have the Holy Spirit's presence with us when we read it to understand that same truth? How many of us go to our Bible to read and forget to pray first? You don't have to raise your hands. A lot of us, a lot of the time. And then we wonder why we're reading along and we come across something. Boy, that's crazy. I can't figure that out. I wonder what that means. Well, the Holy Spirit, if you had asked the Holy Spirit to walk through it with you, you might have got an explanation. Or it might just be that right now God's not wanting to talk to you through that, so it's good to you to read it, but that's not the message for you now. Because God's answers are yes, no, or not yet. That's pretty simple, right? It's yes, no, or not yet. Those are always God's answers to our prayers. But if we're going to understand the truth of God, it requires the Holy Spirit. Now, all of the armor that's talked about, the belt, the breastplate, the helmet, the shoes, all of that is defensive stuff. That's defensive stuff. It's to protect us. And there's a shield. The shield is to protect us from the flaming arrows that the devil throws at us. Because, see, we might be standing there, and all of a sudden we sense that something's coming from over here. We can use the shield to protect all of it. You know, back in those days, most of the shields were made out of wood because the metal ones would be too heavy. But they'd be wood, and they would coat the outside of it with leather that they could soak in water before battle because one of the very popular arms back then were flaming arrows. They'd put a little, wind some stuff around the end of the arrow behind the tip, and they'd dip it in pitch, get it lit up, and shoot it. And if you use your wooden shield to protect you the arrows would embed in it but if you had that wet leather the flames wouldn't be able to catch a shield on fire before you could knock the flaming arrow off we need that shield to deflect those darts that the devil throws at us so we need the breastplate we need the helmet but we need the shield too because sometimes they're coming from multiple directions we all know that but the sword is an offensive weapon So how do we as Christians think an offensive weapon should be used in the spiritual sense? Because all these are spiritual. All these things of the armor, they're spiritual metaphors, okay? They mean something in the spiritual realm. Because he says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. 
We're not supposed to be fighting against each other. Why do we do that? Why do we fight against each other? That's not where the fight is. The fight is with powers and principalities. The evil one is stuff from the spiritual realm. That's where the real fight is. When Jesus raised us up with him to be Christians, we are now spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we have our feet in a sensual world. That's a world that's driven by our senses. Hearing, seeing, smell, taste, touch. But we now just don't perceive by senses alone. We perceived by our spirit too and it's those spiritual things that we're on the lookout for so we're also fighting in the spiritual realm and if we don't recognize that then all this fighting we're doing amongst each other against flesh and blood is totally missing totally missing the boat there's nothing to do with what god wants us to do god wants us to be representatives of christ here in the earth to resist to resist the powers of evil in the spiritual realm. We're to stand firm and not let those things knock us off of our faith journey, which they often do, but that's because we walk out of our house without our, without our armor on. And John Wesley says, if you're missing any part of it, that's the part the devil's going after that day. So you've got to have it all. You can't leave any at home. And so Right after he tells you about what all this stuff is, he tells us to pray without ceasing, more or less. You pray all the time. Pray for everyone and pray about everything. See, the armor becomes active when we pray. Because we're not physically putting on a helmet or a breastplate or a belt or shoes or picking up a shield. These are spiritual things. And spiritual things are activated by prayer. He says, often we don't give what we pray for because we don't ask properly. John Wesley says, we probably don't give what we pray for because we're not praying for other people. We're only praying for ourselves. We're praying for selfish motives. How often do we pray selflessly first and then pray for what we want? Do we pray for others in need first? And then pray for ourselves. Do we pray without ceasing all day long for all the saints? As the scripture tells, he said, pray for all the saints. That means, friends, we got to pray for those people in church we don't like. Yikes. Paul doesn't let anybody get away. Nobody gets away. We need the armor to do the work that God calls us to do. We need the armor to stand up, like when Vody says, Circumstances of the world are changing such. Do we just sit there and clap when the boy beats the girl in a girl's sport? Do we accept when the, where we work tells us that we have to use pronouns on our emails? We have to do it. It's policy. So many branches of the government do that now. I've gotten emails from different branches of the government, and they've got their pronouns on there. The person who's writing back to me it has got their name, their title, and she, her, him, he, him, whatever. It's like, really? So what happens when somebody walks in the door dressed differently and they say now they're somebody else? Really, I've known you for 15 years and you've always been a guy. Now all of a sudden you're wearing a dress and you're a girl? Wow. See, we know that doesn't happen, right? God knits each person together in their mother's womb who he wants them to be. And that's who they're born as. It's people changing people not God God decided who they were but as we know the world is opposed to God in a post-Christian world that we live in you look around out there they're always assaulting Judeo-Christian values they're trying to take they've taken prayer out of schools even when they're trying to institute Bible reading in school you know they were trying to use the Bible to teach some history class and sociology classes and people were pitching a fit about that because they couldn't even use biblical examples. They weren't preaching out of the Bible. They are just showing examples of what different societies use. And they couldn't even do that in social, socialism and social studies. Are you kidding me? They, wouldn't, they weren't teaching about Jesus. They were just talking about how some communities deal with social issues. The ancient Jews, how they did it. How the first century Christians did it. You know, taking care of the widows and orphans and things like that. 
that there were social structures in place for centuries? Well, they can't even talk about that and use the Bible as an example of that because it's the Bible. When are we going to stand up for these things? When, when are we going to stand up? Because if we don't, then what we're seeing of a shrinking church in North America is going to continue. And the people that are out in the world wanting truth, where is truth? When is it going to stand up and speak louder than this noise that everybody knows is lies? Often the people saying it know it's a lie. But because they can say it loud enough, there's nobody countering them. I'm not advocating that we just run out there and start shouting on street corners. What I'm saying, though, is when you know it's wrong and it's right there in front of you, are you calling it wrong or are you just staying neutral? Are you giving God and the Holy Spirit a chance to exercise God's truth? Because that's where the sword comes in. We're not wielding it on our own, friends. It's never been us. It's always been God. And if you doubt the power of that to work, then I want to remind you of those habits and things that you had that you thought you could never break. But yet when you became a Christian, when you decided to follow Christ, God took that away from you. He took away from you that bad habit you thought you could never lose. He got you out of that abusive situation you thought you could never get out of. He got you sober and clean when you thought you could never be sober and clean. God did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. So why do you all of a sudden think that what God's asking you to do means you have to do it by yourself? Why? Paul, in none of these did he say that we're responsible for this. He just says we're supposed to armor up because that's what we're going to need to be able to be Christians in a world that's not friendly to us. And just like the Ephesians were living in a town and a city that was not friendly to Christians, so we, as Grace Wesleyans right here in Fort Lauderdale, are living in a world that's not friendly to us as a whole. Generally speaking, the environment around us is not friendly to us being earnest in claiming children of God identity, disciples of Christ identity. Oh, they're happy that we call the sinner part, but they don't understand what that means to us. We claim to be sinners because we know that Christ died for our sins. And we will be redeemed from that with the blood. They just see it, our admission of being sinners is we're no different than them, but we are different than them. Because we know truth. We know where to find salvation. We know what it means to us. We know about the Holy Spirit and what it does for us. We know about our Christian community. Oh, and by the way, this was not about us individually, by the way. The Greek words that this is translated from is not you or me or I. It's y'all. All y'all. Use guys. Wherever you're from, it's all y'all. It's all of us. It's plural. This is plural meaning. All of us have to do this. All of us put on the belt. All of us put on the breastplate, the helmet, the shoes, the shield, and the sword. All of us. Because God doesn't want to use just one of us. He wants to use all of us. David didn't fight alone. Gideon didn't fight alone. Joshua didn't fight alone. All the big famous generals of the Old Testament, none of them fought alone. They all fought with others. And the others in the Old Testament all had armor. Armor of God. When the few, the 800 with Gideon can go defeat all those tens of thousands or it was 80, I think it was just a ridiculous low number, but it's still more than one. So whether we're 60 or 80 or 200, it doesn't matter. If all of us are wearing the armor, and we know each of us is wearing the armor, we should be less afraid because we know we're not the only one. We already know we're not the only ones being confronted by the stuff that Vody talked about. So friends, no one of you is the only one that's supposed to put on the armor and contend for God in the spiritual sense. But yet all of us do. May we all put on the armor of God.
We have these bookmarks. I hope you'll take one. Put it in your Bible. Put it in whatever book you're reading. And if you read a lot of other books, James Patterson or whatever, stick it in that. Use that in your books you read so you see it all the time. As a reminder, I'm supposed to have my armor of God on him. Pray when you see it and it reminds you. Take a second. Pray for all the saints and pray for God to armor you up because you know you need it. We all need it. Because like Bodhi says, neutrality is not an option. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.